But for this evening, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, Casey Kaplow is the founder, co-founder and creative director of Good, which as they say on their website is an integrated media platform making a magazine, a website, videos, and live events for people who give a damn. Founded in 2006, the quarterly Good magazine, a three-time finalist for the National Magazine Award, is a breakthrough in visual communication. The infographic, those forgettable bar graphs and pie charts so often relegated to the sidebars of our work, are elevated and celebrated on the pages and screens of Good. With breathtaking consistency and creativity, Good transforms unthinkably serious and complicated social problems like healthcare, taxes, and the environmental crisis into visual stories that delight, engage, and inform. What I love about, Good, about the Good infographics is that they clarify these complex topics without oversimplifying them. They don't shy away from the deep details in order to make a pretty picture. And the result is that I really learned something about these topics. I had the uh, pleasure of meeting Case, uh, Casey Kaplow last summer when we were both on the jury for the 2010 Sappy Ideas That Matter competition. And um, you really get to know someone pretty well when you're locked in a hotel conference room together for two and a half days. Um, I found Casey to be a shrewd and thoughtful critic of design with a deep and genuine passion for social change. It's been an amazing 25th anniversary insights series thus far, and I think we're in for a real treat with this evening's finale. So please join me in welcoming Casey Kaplow. All right, hey guys. Um, thank you for that introduction. Thank you so much for having me here. It's really quite an honor um, seeing all those names up on the board. Um, it's a pretty awesome list of people that have been here before. So um, I'll admit I didn't, I hadn't actually heard of this uh, series before. But we have an MCAD guy who works for us, and when he found out that I had been invited, he was super excited for me. So um, <laughs> um, I will try to do it justice. Um, let's see. So yeah, I mean, I just am going to talk today about like a little bit about good and sort of where we've come from, what we're up to, um, sort of how we think about things. And it sort of jumps a little bit all over the place, but hopefully gives you a good sense of, of what we're all about. And then we'll, we'll go to questions at the end. Um, so yeah. Um, so it started for me and, well, for good, about like almost, was it five, a little over five years ago, um, where one of my best friends gave me a call and said, I've got an idea for a magazine called Good. Do you want to help? Um, and it sort of started right there with the title first. And I kind of knew exactly what he had meant. We had been sort of talking about these ideas before. Um, you know, he had started a company called Reason Pictures that was in the film uh, industry in, in LA, which is where we're based. And it was sort of about kind of entertaining, trying to make entertaining and relevant films, films that you know, had some socially redeeming value to them. Um, and that was like the, the rubric for this film production company, which is like a bit of an anomaly in Hollywood. Um, and I had been there sort of with him. We had gone to college together and were just sort of, you know, kicking a lot of these ideas around and seeing a lot of interesting people come through the doors pitching stories or writers or directors, people who wanted to get involved in this idea and um, really felt like there was something there um, that was like bigger than just like a film company. Like there was, People wanted to get engaged with the world in a different way. Um, and this idea for the magazine sort of came out of that. Like film was a kind of a terrible business and a tough way to like engage with the community in a consistent manner. And so, you know, the magazine was this idea of, well, let's make something that can really like plant a flag in the ground and say, this is what this is all about. There's like a new movement afoot. Um, and you know, in many ways we sort of looked to like what Wired had done for technology we wanted to do for this this thing called good. We didn't really have a better name for it. Um, and I guess we still don't. Um, but you know, so one of the things that I, just to point out here is like, for us it really started, it quickly became like a question. Like it's, it's funny if you look at us trying to define ourselves over the last couple of years has been one of our bigger, more ongoing challenges. Um, if you ask people at good what we're doing, you hear a lot of similar but different um, responses to that question. And this is a page from our media kit, um, which I think two years in, and you sort of see like good is all of these different things. And I think it's always been this broad concept. And I think that's been one of the 
the fun and challenging things about good. Um, as I sort of said in the slide before, it's like we definitely started something that was way bigger and more complicated than we could possibly finish. Um, and I think that's been a, in a really kind of critical component to it for us as well and like helped us drive it forward and um, kind of constantly, you know, fight the good fight to, to make it happen and keep it alive. Um, you know, and that said, I think one of the things that we've found is we've been trying to like get at something that doesn't really fit normal definitions. Like for us, this is what good was really all about. It was sort of this intersection of pragmatism and idealism. And we used like in the early days, a little less so now though they still hold true, these like Venn diagrams to really define um, what we were trying to do. And it, you know, it wasn't about sort of either or, it was about like doing both at the same time. So like being pragmatic and being idealistic are equally important to bring to everything we do. And, um, you know, I think that's really like the, the major overriding ethos of good. Um, you know, but there are other ones as well. And I think, you know, Doug sort of actually spoke to it, but like having fun with serious topics and kind of being serious about how we have, have, how we have fun has been really important to us. And, um, you know, whether that's through infographics or just how we write or how we do visual journalism or, you know, having parties to raise money for nonprofits, um, you know, it's been a, like a big part of what we do. Um, you know, and again, this one, the sort of entertainment and relevance, they're all sort of the same thing said in different ways. Um, but this, this actually came out of that film company first. But really, I think when you look at how we try to, how we look at the media that we make, um, it's really sort of in that space. Um, yeah, and I think lastly, I think it's the last one I have, but again, the idea that, you know, this is like a really global phenomenon that we're talking about. And I think we see it more and more all the time, but, um, at the same time, like being really actionable, being really local is like really critical to what good is all about. And, and this thing that we're trying to make and this movement that we're trying to speak to or the, you know, at the intersection of these places. Um, so that said, you know, I sort of wanted to jump to some examples of um, things that do a better job of like getting right to the core of it. So like while good may float around sometimes internally and paint these sort of fuzzy you know, pictures of what we're trying to do that you can kind of understand, but you can't really say quickly. Um, there are a few things that I think have done it for us that uh, amazingly. And, you know, one, this was, we had the amazing fortune of publishing this in the first issue. We had sort of always from the beginning done thematic issues. And the first issue of Good, which was 2006, like late summer 2006, it was sort of before the midterms. I think we were feeling you know, like a lot of good, it was like taking back the word good. Like we sort of wanted to take back the idea of like America and patriotism. And um, so we had set up this theme of I Heart America. And we did this piece called the Graphic Statement, which was two opening spreads to every issue. And the idea was to like farm it out to different creative, you know, groups, studios, agencies. And um, this is one of the first pieces we assigned. We assigned this before we even had I think anybody else in place working on the magazine. And it was a, with this group called WK12, which is Wyden Kennedy's sort of experimental school that they run with 12 kids inside of their agency in Portland. Um, and after a bunch of rounds, they sort of came back and presented this to us, which this was the first spread, um, and this was the second. And this is one of the few pieces that like still hangs on the walls in the good office. And it just sort of like, when we saw that, they like presented us like 30 ideas, which were all amazing. And then this one was at the end, and it was just like, yep, that is perfect. That's exactly what we want to say. Um, and so, you know, I think, again, these sort of like mottos are things that are really sort of beautiful. Um, I'm really proud to have like worked with these guys and had this, had this in the magazine. And I think it, it sort of set an amazing bar for what we were all about. Um, and again, like, yeah, other people who sort of, you know, other people just like added to what good was so crystal clear, it was, it was amazing. Um, I mean, and then sort of jumping off from there, these are sort of other mottos I think we've, we've taken hold of at Good. So this, this, this mural is at WK12's offices. Um, and it's actually, I was there while they were making it. I got to go visit. Um, so this was back in 2006. And that's made of um, push pins. So fail harder is the mural, if you couldn't read it. And it's like push pins, and there's like I think 150,000 of them um, that they use to fill up this wall. And the, you know, it's recently the fail harder thing is one that 
we've started to say more around good, and I think a spirit we definitely try to get behind. And um, I just love this, both for what it says and how they did it, and like the sort of insanity of wanting to, you know, make a mural out of push pins and clearly like not knowing whether or not you can pull that off when you realize that you probably need 150,000 push pins and where you get those and like how many staples you have to like clear out of all the push pins. Um, and you know, I think that sort of speaks to that like that idea so perfectly of like just boldly jumping into things you don't know how you're going to get out of. Um, and I think it's something we've really embraced at Good of like that fail harder thing. Like it's really hard to fail when you're when you set out to fail. Um, you're probably going to do something pretty cool or interesting. And I think you usually end up failing when you're trying not to fail. Um, and so I think it's something that's that's been been a good thing for us and you know again came out of the WK12. Um, this really similarly um, was a piece we just ran in our uh, work issue, which was a couple issues ago, by a guy named Mike Montero. And um, it, it came accompanied with an essay, which I, if you guys can find it online or have the issue, I totally recommend you read. It's sort of amazing. Um, but just this notion of like, again, just I think it's a spirit we've really tried to adopt of like just going for it and like making mistakes and having that be part of the process. Um, and being really honest about that. And it's sort of just about getting stuff out there and improving and, and iterating forward, um, I think is a big thing. And this has been, it, it's much better when you read the essay, but it's still like, I think a fun notion of, you know, being proud of, of trying to make mistakes. Um, and the last sort of like kind of bold motto I'm gonna share, this actually comes from Rural Studio, um, which is down in Alabama. And it's that sort of outpost of, um, Auburn's architecture program that this guy Sam Mockby started. And I'm sure some of you guys know of it, but they do some really kind of interesting social design projects where they have the students go out there and build homes uh, for the citizens in this really poor county. And this is like in their studio. And again, I just think a really nice notion, like this is when you're like leaving the studio. It's like right above the door. Um, and just something, I think again, that we sort of, ideas that like we hold dear at good. Um, so then back, back to good and, and inside of what we're up to. Um, you know, obviously we sort of you quickly find out good is one of the most commonly used words in the English language. Um, the puns like come rapid fire at first anytime you meet somebody and then like quickly die down because everyone gets over it really, really fast. Um, but so, you know, from that starting point, point of having good, I sort of back to like the design evolution side. Um, this is like one of the first pieces of collateral we had sort of produced back in 2005. You can sort of see a, you know, early kind of crappy uh, version of our logo and sort of where we might be going. Um, and then we sort of ended up, you know, working with this company um, called Area 17 and this sort of amazing designer, Arnaud Mercier, who is based in France actually, and sort of, you know, that began the, the sort of goods real sort of entry into the design world, I think, was working with them. and developing our identity. Um, so you can sort of see some really early explorations here, which I think is just sort of fun, fun to see. Um, you know, obviously sort of like honing in on what, what we were and, and where exactly we went. Um, and it's really interesting. I mean, I think the logo for us, um, this is like a, a, an inside perspective, like the logo for us has been a big, you know, I think people have come to really love it and I do as well. Um, at the same time, it was like a really difficult process for me, and I felt like we never quite got it right as we were doing it. In the end, it was just like, screw it, let's run with it. It's like the deadline is coming up. Um, and it's funny how it sort of builds and just adds, you know, resonance and, and meaning over time. Um, and that said, I'm going to share a few examples, which I think are really funny, of since then, like this, this word, it looking sort of similar to this, has like appeared all over the place. And I don't want to, I'm not taking credit for this, I think partly it's just like what works, but this is Ben, our CEO, and Jay, our like head of sales, Ben looking kind of incredulous about a Gap postcard that has good um, set exactly like that. And that was like shortly after a meeting we'd had with Gap that they then decided to not give us any money. So I think he was particularly pissed about that. Um, you know, this was like other, other books that came out and things. And it's just like starting to see it, it made me eventually at first, you sort of get upset about this stuff, and then you kind of realize that, you know, maybe it's just like the only way that word actually looks good is um, <laughs> in, in all caps. Um, 
And to that point, if I can make this YouTube video work, I will try, which really hammers home the point. This is a Portland Trailblazers rap song um, from like maybe the 90s. I don't know what, what year. Look really closely as if this works. Up and then they scream. But that one thing coach said kept me guessing. What's that word, man? Now I'm stressing. I got the good. Yeah. So when I, one of our design, one of our former designers moved to Portland and somehow came across that and sent it to us, and it was totally amazing. Um, so anyhow, for whatever that's worth. Um, okay, so I think now, like, sort of, you know, if you sort of, this is a little all over the place, but you know, if you, we had our identity and sort of telling a little bit of the story of good, I think, you know, one of the next things we went into was like building the magazine, and um, we started to work with this guy Scott Stoll, um, who spoke here a couple of years ago um, from his firm Open, um, and that was like one of the more, you know amazing connections I think we've made over time. Like his, his sensibility and, and mine and ours really overlapped perfectly and I, helped, I think really helped set good up for, for the space it occupies today. Um, so I mean this is like super early like template of the magazine. But I think one of the, the things that Scott did really beautifully was, you know, other than like being just a generally stellar designer, um, I think he like set up a system of some really kind of simple rules in the end that we were able to to plug a lot of different ideas into, a lot of different people into, and, and something that really stayed focused on the content. I think that's always been really important to us. Um, and you know, what I'm gonna sort of run through a bunch of the infographics, and I think in a way this is where we nailed it best, was like we created this space, and you know, as, as it actually started, we worked with 2x4, an agency um, uh, in New York. Also, Michael Rock was, looked like he had spoke here a few years back. Um, and, you know, we had them do these infographics. And again, this was one of those things that was like assigned before we had Scott on board, before we had a lot of other pieces in place. Um, and they were gonna do this whole section of infographics, which was our big idea, because we just liked infographics. So we were like, let's do a lot of them. Um, and, um, you know, they did them, and we were gonna have them do the next one, and then they were like not available all of a sudden. So we had to like go on to other people. Um, and that wasn't planned, but it turned out to be like an amazing accident and I think really set us up to do cool work and going out to like different people than every issue and now on, online, which is much more of our focus. Every month we do four, we do a weekly piece. Um, so uh, four pieces with a new studio, a new artist each month. Um, but I think in just sort of having like a really simple template and basically, you know, we have a decent amount of typefaces that we use at Good, um, but those were the rules that we gave to these designers. We were sort of like, use our typefaces and you know, fit it in our space, but otherwise it's up to you. So stylistically, you can run whichever way makes you feel better. And we, you know, we were working with them um, to sort of hone in editorially, but you get this huge range of stuff, and yet I think it, it helps, it still all feels like good just through that really simple system. And I think that's something I'm very proud of with this. And so just running through a few. You know, these were some of the first three from, uh, from two by four. Um, this was about Paris Hilton's like explosion to fame around that time. Um, you know, and we've been totally all over the map in these, like this, from serious topics to not so serious to like successful ones to total failures. Um, this is one that I really love for how crazy it is. Um, it's by Office of CC, which is a Dutch firm, and um, the idea. It's about Wikipedia. The idea is that. Each of these dots um, is, well, on, on a spread. And then there's like a key of how many spreads it would take to equal certain statistics about Wikipedia. So like the idea is that there's like 250,000 dots on this spread. And so it would take 45 spreads next to each other to like represent how many entries um, Wikipedia had. And it's like a really fun idea. Um, we actually had someone at the office count and or do some multiplication and realize there aren't 250,000 dots on this thing. So it, fa it falls apart on some levels, but I think um, is definitely like, I think speaks to like the area that we were trying to operate in of like, you know, in some ways it's experimental, in some ways it was like giving designers a lot of freedom and saying, how do you think it would be interesting to explore this idea? 
Um, and I think we did a lot of hiring people, finding people who hadn't done it before, um, which was really interesting. Like we, and I think a lot of people did infographics sort of for the first time in working with us. Um, and I know now some of them are getting sick of it because um, they keep doing it. But um, you know, it, it, I think it's been a really sort of fun process in like pushing this sort of visual communication, sort of visual journalism um, in a lot of different ways. So just sort of rifling through a few more. I mean, this was, this was by this guy, Tyler Lang, who was the one who showed us the Trailblazers piece, um, or the Trailblazers video. And also, he's getting sick of infographics. Um, this was by Future Farmers. Um, you know, just all these sort of different, different styles. This was um, by Volume One out of New York. Um, this is like a more techie sort of, I think, more recent one that we just did. Um, this was a really kind of interesting one where it was by Fogelson Lubliner in New York, um, who actually had worked with Scott at, at his studio and then went off on their own. And this was about like the distance of water sources from major metropolitan areas. And they actually went out to like Rockaway Beach and had people pose in distance to like represent how far away the water sources were. So you, like the key up there corresponds to their sweatshirt color. Um, so whether it's like a local source or a river or a lake. Um, so yeah, I mean, it definitely like gets totally all over the map, but I think, you know, and it's, a, it, it's partly amazing to me when people like, I think, it, I think we've done something really cool with this, this sort of exploration and this side of good, um, but we've definitely made some really sort of impenetrable crappy ones too. Um, this one I think is super cool. I mean, this was, this was actually by Scott, by Open, just charting like happiness measurements with like a simple bar graph set in a smiley face, which is brilliant. <laughs> Um, this is, I think, so I like telling the story about this one because it's like, this was the most controversial thing we ever, the biggest fight we ever got in it good. Um, and this was sort of about Darfur. We were like, this was around the time when Darf, the crisis in Darfur was a really big deal and everyone was like, what the hell is going on there? And no one could actually answer you. So we're like, let's do an infographic about it. And that's, that was, that tends to be our process is us just being like, can someone explain this to me? And no one can. And then we say, well, let's, let's make an infographic out of that. Um, but Scott's sort of proposal back to us was the sort of map and stuff like that is, doesn't help. Like, let's just tell the story in really plain speak of what's going on. Um, and so they proposed this sort of cartoon, if you will, um, narrating like the sort of five, five or six points of what, what was causing this crisis. Um, and it turned into a huge fight on the inside of Good as to whether or not this was too glib and we should run it. We ended up running it. We made like a couple little tweaks that were super minor. Um, I was really on the side of it. I don't think we really ever heard anything back from it. But on the inside, it was like a huge, a huge ordeal whether or not this was appropriate or not. Um, something else that I think has been sort of fun that we've done over in our first issue, we did this like political NASCAR thing. Um, <laughs> Which I can't take credit for the idea. We like had some book somewhere in the office that was like a book of ideas or something like that. And like one of the ideas was like politicians should wear you know badges on their on their suits like NASCAR drivers. Um, and we thought that was brilliant. So we made one you know back in um, I think that's Clinton and Santorum back in the midterm elections in 2006. You got the presidential election in 2008. Um, you know we did one in the midterms. Um, and I think it's kind of, what's kind of amazing also is I just literally found this today. Um, but this was on Reddit, like a thread started on Reddit that was getting tons of comments and one of our editors found it and was like, oh my God, like we, this is what we've been doing, we should respond. Um, but somebody jumped in on Reddit and, you know, mocked one up, which is pretty amazing to see it actually photoshopped and not in Illustrator. Um, so yeah, um, a sort of similar thing that I'll show here is this piece that we did. And what year? This is 07. So we did this piece on female world leaders. And the grid, basically, is this weird Frankenstein mashup of their faces. Um, and the sort of pixels or squares represent how many millions of people they govern. So, you know, how many people they, these women's countries represent. Um, and so I think days after we went to press, um, before anyone had even seen the magazine, um, 
the president, I believe, of India was elected as a woman, which like threw it wildly out of whack. Um, and, um, and so this was really cool. Like this was someone on our site just sort of like, you know, grabbed it and made an edit of it and like posted it back on our site. Um, and it was sort of amazing and I think really sort of set up this idea of like, you know, the sort of collaborative nature of good and like the idea that we were sort of starting discussions that we definitely wanted other people to be involved in. And I think that's been a big success in that front, but something we definitely try to do a lot. Um, which sort of brings me here. And I think that, that realization, I think, is something we, we kind of always had. Like in some of our earliest materials, we'd talk about like being a participatory brand and a participatory sort of community that we wanted to build. Um, but I think it's something we've, we've continually tried to, to make happen and has in some ways and, and not in others. Um, one of my little like secrets I'll share with you guys, this is totally random, there's an Australian company called the Remo General Store, um, like Remo, Remo, generalstore.com, which is a very quirky enterprise that I think is so ahead of its time and how it thinks about what it's doing. Um, and they're, one of their slogans is the community is the brand. And they're sort of this store that sells like designy items, but it's, they do a lot of like development of what products they should sell through their community. Um, and it's really interesting like, how it's like moderated, you know, between the top down and the bottom up. And just, it's like a very web 2.0 kind of idea that's been around for probably 10 years. Um, so anyhow, this is something I found along the way and I think has been a reference point of mine. Um, and something we definitely, they, they like speak about their philosophy and how they work really well, probably better than they execute it. Um, so, but, you know, it sort of brings me back to like the first cover of Good, which was here. I mean, some of you guys might have seen it. That little um, message above that box says a do-it-yourself personal manifesto. Um, and this was like a total last minute scramble of what the cover should be, but we ended up here. And I think, you know, it's something we still really, you know, feel really great about. And I think it's amazing to me how well it's held up over time as to what we're all about. Um, you know, this idea that good is sort of whatever you are, whatever you want to do, like do it like you give a damn, whether it's design like you give a damn or like practice medicine or law or, you know, start a business like you give a damn, like that sort of, that was the call to arms of good. Um, and it didn't really matter where you were coming from. And, you know, I think that both that idea and also the sort of that participatory nature that we tried to set up here of like involving people um, in what we were all about and involving them in what this whole movement was about, I think was, was a big piece of it that we set up back then. Um, you know, speaking a bit to the website, which is really our core focus right now, um, you know, I don't know how much of you guys have checked it out, but like we do a lot, we sort of try to follow up on that and like do a lot of open-ended projects and a lot of like, this is like daily, we sort of ask weird questions and you know, starting to just get like the pulse of the, of the community and I think it helps us you know, in some ways, like, it's just sort of interesting and builds community. In other ways, it sort of, I think, helps set up what interests and directions are to help us sort of figure out where to go next. And we've definitely done some with some issues of, like, putting out the issue theme and soliciting ideas and um, pitches and stuff like that. And it's been pretty successful. Um, so it's a cool sort of collaborative thing that we're definitely getting better at um, as we go. Um, and I'll share a few other projects in this space. So we did, you know, this sort of, in partnership with Streets Blogs and the Livable Streets Network, um, we did this thing where they sort of proposed what a livable street is, like a multi-use street that is for not just cars, but for cars and pedestrians and buses and bikes and, and sort of the full, the full gamut of what is in a city. Um, and we sort of put this out to our community as a, as a sort of challenge and got back some really amazing results. So I forgot what city this is in. Um, but this person sort of reimagined it this way. Um, you know, and I think this was in Virginia somewhere. This person went a little crazy and built like a whole complex on the right side. Um, but nonetheless, like I think these were some of our beginning like explorations and actually doing more complicated, um, you know, kind of projects with the community. And we, since then we've been doing a ton, whether it's just simple questions or doing infographics, um, doing these sort of like redesign certain spaces sort of projects. There's, there's a lot there and I think it's been a really fruitful endeavor. Um, you know, and I think this speaks to like one of the core tenets of good, which is really about, 
And I think how we look at design is really that of like designing solutions. I think it, it, we're an interesting brand, and it's interesting that I'm here because like we didn't set out to be in the design world per se, or to be a design publication certainly. But I think we've really appealed to designers in a very strong way, and I think part of that's just maybe some of the people we've got involved in my own having like a founder who's a creative director who like really cares and is interested about this space just sort of led us there. Um, but I also think we've we've always looked at design not through the lens of being a designer, but of like what design can be and how we can use it. Um, you know, this was for that, well, for our sixth issue, which was the design issue, um, we had IDEO do the opening spread, that graphic statement, that was the America Love It or Fix It one from before, and they sort of just put out this, um, you know, San Francisco street corner, and then, you know, the next page was like scribbling in all these things that could be fixed or could be improved, and, you know, set up this notion of design as, as problem solving, um, which is really what we dedicated the issue to. Um, and I think that's been really strong for us, like the idea that, like for us, design is about a means, not an ends. Um, and this was the, that cover that we ran that issue, um, which I think was one of our better covers. Um, just in, you know, there was a bit of a piece on the AK-47, which was around its anniversary, and you know, the sort of strength of like amazing design that it that it represents. Um, and you know, asking that question of like, are are we designing other things as well as that? Um, so yeah, I think that's it's always been. The relationship with good and design has been, I guess, an interesting one. And you know, one thing I wanted to sort of share is some of you guys may have seen this poster. Um, I, it sounds like I don't need to read it for you. Um, but um, you know, I would say I don't entirely agree with this. Um, you know, I think, but I, I think this sort of speaks to like the weird world or moment that design is in right now. And I think we've participated in that discussion of really advocating like for design as this way to solve problems and designers can help change the world. Um, and I totally believe that's true, but I also think it's not like, not alone and not the only way it's gonna happen. And I think, um, you know, it's an interesting thing seeing that backlash that this poster represents or people getting mad about like, you know, designers doing posters about Japan um, to raise money for Japan. And I think there's, there's this interesting tension between the sort of, visual aspect of design and design as creating something you know beautiful and meaningful and design as as problem solving as a method and I think you know I guess our opinion at good my opinion is that they they absolutely should coexist it's sort of like that Venn diagram thing like why why would you have one and not the other um, so I think this is like equally as obnoxious as the designer who thinks they actually can go save the world on their own um, so you know, I think another thing that is all sort of threaded throughout here is, you know, I think a big piece of good has been about creativity and sustainability. And, um, you know, I guess that just sort of runs through everything we've been, we, we do and like really celebrating creative solutions um, and sort of creative engagement as like a new form of like activism, if you will. Um, you know, and the one thing I sort of share here, just like a, a quick, I guess, statement or saying is, um, this is, uh, this is from Curitiba, Brazil, and the mayor, former mayor of Curitiba, Brazil, put these buses in, uh, one of his many like, amazing enhancements to the city, uh, where he put these like, sort of raised platforms for buses in to allow them to like, load faster so they don't have to lower down, and it's safer, and it basically like, sped up um, how quickly they can move and decreases congestion and all these amazing things, and he did, this guy's name is Jamie Lerner, and he went on to do you know, a ton of other amazing sort of enhancements to, to urban life. Um, he, he's, I believe, quoted as saying, if you want a creative solution, take a zero off the budget. Um, and if you want a sustainable solution, take two zeros off the budget. And, you know, I think there's something amazing about that. And, uh, you know, I think sustainability does sometimes get hurt by being in, like, the no, you need less, like, turn the lights off, like, you know, kind of, do more with less kind of camp. But I think just thinking like that, I think is a really powerful thing. And I think, you know, our, our founder's father, um, Ben, our, the CEO, his father, um, who started Inc. Magazine, um, had, had, he had grown up hearing like that creativity is inversely proportional to capital. 
So it's like a more business way of saying that. But I think, I think it's very true, and it's something we've learned sometimes the hard way. Like when you have too many resources, you do dumb, not creative things. And when you're really confined is when creativity like truly comes out. And I think the same of sustainability. So I think that's something that we really look to. Um, you know, I think another thing that good is really all about, in a way, just it's, it's all these things just said differently, is like fixing things. Um, and this is another piece that I sort of found. I don't know if you guys had seen it. It's from a little while ago. This Dutch company called Platform 21 put it out um, as the repair manifesto, which I think is one of the more like eloquent, brilliant ways of putting sustainability that has nothing to do with sustainability. Um, but it basically just says like make you know make stuff that lives longer and make stuff that can be fixed and fix things that are broken. Um, and it's so simple, but it's kind of what it's all about um, as designers, as like people creating things. Like, you know, I think that's a way to view sustainability. And I think for us um, and for me, like what this also represents is just you know something that good's really been about, which is just like knocking this really complicated, hairy stuff down to a much more like accessible, um, sort of plain talking level. Um, and I think this is like an amazing example of that. Um, also, I guess just sort of, I always love telling the story, but to me this sort of like, in celebration of fixing things, these guys um, in Paris, there's a little group called Untergunter, Unter I believe, um, who for like years were breaking into this building in Paris to fix the clock. Um, <laughs> And it like took them a long time, and they finally fixed the clock, and then like the city eventually like was too embarrassed about it, and like they let the bells ring like one time, and then they they shut it down. Um, totally ridiculous, but and sort of a, a tangent, but again, it's just this idea of fixing things and sort of taking things into your own hands and like the sort of on the ground nature of it. I think it's one of my favorite stories that that I just find super inspiring. Um, so. I guess sort of related to this, this is a statement from, from Scott. This is something I learned from Scott Stoll at Open, uh, who would occasionally, during our back and forth about design things, would comment that some idea sounded like it was putting a hat on a hat. Um, which, you know, which is to say that's a bad idea. Just uh, one, one hat is good enough, and you don't need to put a hat on a hat. Um, and I think you know, it speaks really well to, I think, the philosophy that we've tried to bring to to sort of, again, how we view design or how we want to use design at good. Um, you know, to be like really straightforward and to be a sort of, you know, create a, a wonderful space for content and for ideas um, and not to sort of dress them up. I mean, one thing with good that I've sort of will say with a lot of people that we're working with, certainly on any identity sense, is that we're not trying to be too cool. Like, we don't really want like we want to be awesome because we're doing really awesome things, but we don't want to be cool because we're like trying to like be cool or different. Um, and I think you know, I said another way. This was uh, something I just heard. I was at a, a lecture in New York last year by um, this guy named Naoto Fukasawa, who's a famous Japanese designer who does a lot of stuff with Muji, and you might have seen some of his like the CD player with like the little pull string. Um, but like like all of Muji, it's like amazingly simple. Um, elegant work. And he was sort of saying how a lot of designers sort of are focused on this shape and like the sort of piece that they want to design. Whereas with him and with Muji, they really are sort of focused on like the space that you're sort of expecting in your head. Um, and I think it's sort of this totally flipped on its head way of thinking about what, what you're making. And I think with good, I, I feel like we've tried to do that and not said as eloquently, but you know, we're trying to make things that people feel like already existed, um, that, that feel like they fit into their lives like really seamlessly. And at the same time can feel really new and you can wonder why you haven't ever seen this before, but it still feels totally obvious that it's there. Um, and I think it's a sort of similar idea that, that we're definitely striving for in a lot of what we do. Um, now that said, on the total tangent, you probably can't read this, it says doing weird things. Um, we definitely, I think, try to go, we're very comfortable doing stuff that doesn't make any sense sometimes. And I think that's something I really love about working at Good. There's not like a really like, strong filter um, all the time. Um, this is, I think, the weirdest thing we've ever done. Um, this was our big ideas issue. And that's Danny DeVito riding a Segway. Um, 
in front of what are <coughs> 10 foot tall letters that say ideas propped up on a New York City street. Um, and I mean, I don't know that it's successful at all, but I am still amazed that we actually did it. Um, and I mean, this was like an idea that came up in a meeting where like the sequence was honestly, someone was like, we should do like big ideas letters on the street. And someone was like, that's cool. And then someone else said, what if like Danny DeVito is riding a Segway in front of it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and someone actually knew Danny, how to get in touch with Danny DeVito and we then did it. Um, <laughs> And it amazes me. Um, I don't know if that you can see it. Right now. Um, I mean, it's so weird. Um, this was also—I don't know if you guys ever saw this. We had it. We did like I, maybe for like a couple months in like 2008. We did a daily um, news show with an animated host um, called Good News, and that was Roger Numbers. Um, this was weird in a different way because it was like complicated and took a lot of planning to produce. Well, so did the other one. But um, nonetheless, I mean, this was actually, I think, a really amazing thing. And then it sort of coincided with the downfall of the economy. And certain things had to go. And this was one of those things. Um, but again, I'm, like, I'm proud of having like, gone there and, done and tried this. Um, we still occasionally get people who ask where Roger Numbers is. Um, this was another idea, again, I guess similar time. but. When the economy did collapse and magazines were like folding left and right around the end of 2008 and beginning of 2009, um, we were also in a weird position. Um, and someone, again, jokingly was like, "We should our next issue should just be like a postcard." Um, and while we didn't go that far, we did make a like a, I guess an eight-page, like four pieces of paper folded uh, booklet, um, the recession issue that was as big as like that big. Um, which again, I, like that was, I think a, a fun thing to do, and and again, like something I'm really proud of. It good that we're able to, just not not hold any of these rules so strong that we like, are cons like won't do things like this. Which isn't to say it's not a conversation, but that we'll at least do it. Um, and something like a detail that I find kind of funny is like the scaling of the logo and all that is identical to our normal issue. So we just like kind of chopped it. Um, this, was a, this was a failure of a, a leap. So this was actually our work issues cover that we sent to the printer. And then some people at work saw it and were like, no, we can't do that. Um, which then got into like, it wasn't a fight, but it definitely was like a serious conversation because that doesn't happen a lot at Good. Um, and we sort of ultimately pulled it back. So obviously, it's the work issue. We thought it would be funny if someone was Xeroxing their butt on the cover. Um, turned out not to, not to be funny enough to some people that <laughs> we, we retreated, which was kind of demoralizing, I will say. Um, and in like a last minute scramble, um, we, um, we called Christoph Neiman. And he actually did this for us. And I don't know that it's better or not. I, actually, I kind of like it for how dopey it is. Um, <laughs> but like, this is what we did in like a day um, that we had after that, um, which it is what it is. And our CEO, who was one of the people who was on the side of we can't run that, um, thought that I did this out of spite, um, <laughs> so, which is not true, but it, it is what it is. Um, so again, there's something not ours, but just in the camp of, of weird ideas, I just sort of like, I like sort of shouting out these guys, PyLab, because I think it's like a fun example of, you know, these designers, this is part of Project M down in Greensboro, Alabama, you know, had this idea to start a pie shop. And that's pretty much the idea. Like, you know, they, they figured that it would like encourage community and conversation, and it has, um, but they sell pie. And, I think that's cool that like designers would just want to do something like that and then do it, um, and it's working. Like people really love this and want to do it in other places, and you know I think it's a fun real world example of, of some of that just taking a strange leap. Um, this idea of like being fast is like I think I'd say I mean a lot of these other ones are things I think we've often held dear at good. I think fast is like kind of a new one that we're trying to trying to come around on. Um, so I don't have any of our own examples to share, but I do think as we move more into like the 
you know, technology space, um, it's a big priority of ours to like try to like move much quicker, get things to sort of get things out there faster. We had the the good fortune of working on Long Shot Number Two, which is the Forty Eight Hour Magazine. Um, so, well, Long Shot Number One, the second Forty Eight Hour Magazine, uh, was hosted at the Good offices. So, we got a fun weekend to put that together with them, which was weirdly similar to the normal Good Magazine process. It didn't really feel all that different. Um, but I think there's really something that's going on in this space, be it the 48-hour magazine or you know, Project M does these like M blitzes, these like 48-hour you know, make something sort of camps where there's, there's like hackathons that are going on in the tech space. Um, you know, in the sort of technology and there's this notion of like the minimum viable product, which is you know, what's, what's the least something needs to get out there to prove that it'll work. Um, and I think that's like a big interest and focus of ours these days. I, and I guess it especially pertains to the web, but as we are looking to like build out new products that are beyond our website, beyond the magazine, and sort of figuring out how we move really swiftly um, and really sort of strip it down to its essence to get it out there is, a, is definitely a new and, and interesting focus of ours. Um, and I think this is the last section I have. So, you know, one thing I want to mention, like with good, Sometimes people ask if we're or assume we're a nonprofit, um, and we're not. And I think one of the ideas of good has always been to go out to prove this concept of, you know, we can be a for-profit company and have this mission in the world, and it can work, and it can actually help us be successful. Um, you know, this is one of the core tenets that's existed with good for a long time: is that this is not about altruism. Um, that's not to say we're opposed to altruism, but. What good is really about is it's sort of these Venn diagrams. It's about self-interest and the greater interest sort of aligned. So we, d we sort of wanted to be a counterpoint to these ideas of good that we felt had been dominating the conversation about good before us, which was about like, you know, renouncing your worldly possessions and, you know, working at a soup kitchen and things like that that, you know, didn't necessarily seem fun. And I think with good, we really wanted to, to like go find new models, models that weren't you know so in one camp or the other, um, and so I think that's something we've we've tried to be like our own sort of case study for, and clearly have some successes and some failures, um, and obviously and it's a lot of what we seek out in what we cover and, and kind of who we, who we try to work with and how we try to work with them. Um, you know, this I guess is another expression of that, and it's one of those charts that goes back um, a long way for us, and it's. It's basically like if you think of the not just a profit and loss, but a, a harms and helps spectrum, like we want to be in the top right. And, um, you know, I think with this, we also are not anti, you know, corporation. Like we, we basically just want to see everyone move up into that section. So maybe you're sort of in a company that's like not doing, that's kind of hurting the world in some way, but making money. Like as long as there are honest efforts to move over, I think that's meaningful and I think that's important and it's not like we're just going to end giant companies and start fresh ones over there. It's like seeing this shift um, is what we really want to help help with and help hap make that hap happen. Um, so I think this is like some of that sort of business philosophy that we have. Um, and with that, I guess, you know, just one of the things that we've been getting, a space we've been getting a lot into is like much more kind of collaborative work with companies which has been really interesting for us. I think it's, it started a couple of years ago, but it's, it's become a much bigger piece of it. So this is something we just did with IBM. Um, and, you know, it's a really interesting part of the process when you start all of a sudden, like, having a client to answer to, having, in many cases, been the client before that. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's produced some really interesting work, and it's stuff we're really excited about. Like, this IBM thing is a relationship we've had for a couple of years. We did some, a lot of stuff on cities last year or two years ago, this past year we did stuff on, you know, their sort of business studies that they're doing, um, and hopefully we have some interesting stuff in the works with them this year. Um, you know, and it's sort of like creating like custom content is like this new kind of endeavor, and it's, it's funny trying to walk these lines of like, you know, it has to be right for the good audience, um, good community, and also has to serve the interests of this company that we're working with. Um, and this was like something we did with the Ford Edge where we actually did like a tour across the country of innovators um, and sort of were able to do some video of them. And it's, it's, it's cool when it enables us to do things we wouldn't otherwise have been able to do like this trip. Um, 
but again, it's just like it's a new part of like the journey of good is like navigating these pro these these relationships and processes. Um, and then this is one that you know I don't know if, if you guys probably wouldn't know about or have seen, but uh, well, you, you may have seen the Pepsi Refresh project, um, which is Pepsi's huge initiative of the last year or two, and that's actually something that we ended up helping um, helping them sort of conceive of with a few different agencies, and then. As it got off the ground, we sort of took over a sort of management piece of that, where the big idea, if you guys haven't heard, is they took a huge chunk of their marketing budget, you know, in the tens of millions, and um, gave it, decided to like dedicate it to grants that were given through this sort of web platform they built that was like a democratic voting um, in different brackets of grants. So everything from $250,000 grants down to $5,000 grants. Um, so it was like really sort of a bold move on their part and something we were really proud and excited to have helped, you know, I guess, navigate with them. Um, and so that's been like a, a cool project and stuff that we're definitely starting to do more of and speak with more companies about doing that kind of work. Um, you know, this is just sort of a breakdown. I don't, I don't know the total number, but it's been a few hundred projects and, you know, I'd say 10-ish. Ten plus million dollars that so far they've been granted to these community organizations. And another cool thing that was one of our real big fights in the process was making sure it wasn't just nonprofits. So it's actually to small, you know, individuals, to nonprofits, to basically people who have civic-minded things that they want to do um, can all enter. And I think it speaks to sort of like a shift in in how companies are thinking about doing good and how companies are marketing. And this is Pepsi. They're not a perfect company by any means, but I think to think of you know, a marketing budget that previously would have gone to like Super Bowl ads or crazy billboards and, you know, giving back in a way that also does market them, I think is, is a really interesting thing. Um, and one that we're definitely excited to participate in that evolution of, of marketing in that way. Um, and I guess with that, I think this is really sort of interesting to me. Part, so to help speak to this effort, we're, we're developing some, you know, that, that side of our business. Um, and how we want to like work more with companies, um, and this is like a piece that actually is running in the current issue that is gone to print but not out yet, uh, which through no direction of my own really amazingly sort of mimicked the first cover in many ways, and I think is really interesting in this like kind of idea of us creating a space to like work with our community to like create this new um, agency model, if you will. Um, where we want to like you know have have participation in what defines a you know a company and to see it become a better sort of entity in the world, um, and so yeah, it was really fascinating to me to see to see this come to life um, and how closely it resembled um, you know what we set out at to do you know years ago, um, and that's what I've got. This is this is the offices in LA. This this is uh, what it looks like back home, and that's what I've got so far. So I'm happy to take any questions. I guess they have mics in the, in the aisles. There's one. There's another. Hi. I had a question about your advertisers. It looks like you design the ads that are in the magazine or maybe are influencing them. Can you talk about the history of that and the relationships? It also seems like you have a very small handful and sort of one in each category type approach. I'd like to hear more about that. Sure. Um, so there's not like any hard and fast rules or stuff around how those ads work. Sometimes there are ads that we've designed. Usually those relate to projects that we've gotten more involved in. Um, so if it's just a brand advertising those are almost always their own brand. And I definitely some of those seem like they have been influenced by us, but not through our own actual like getting our hands in there. Um, and then, yeah, some of the other ones when we're working with companies on a more sort of collaborative endeavor that takes more time and produces content or things like that, we'll end up you know, producing some of the creative around that. Um, yeah, and as for the advertisers, I mean, 
you know, that's a big, that is, that's how our business works right now. So um, we're obviously looking for, for new advertisers all the time. We're like in an interesting size where we're, we're not like mass market. So in many ways, like finding one advertiser per category um, has been really like a good fit for us. Um, there's not like a ton of competition in there. Um, but as we grow, it's definitely, we're starting to see some of those categories get built out with more and more people in the space. And obviously we, we hope to see that be the case. There's a question in the middle somewhere, right, right in there. I think if they want you to wait for the microphone if you can. I'm curious about the evolution of kind of where you started and where you're at as it relates to your demographic. That is an interesting question. So I would say, I don't know if we know that as well as we might want to know that. Um, you know, what's, when we've done studies, which we've done like two or three really since we started, so we don't do one quite every year, um, it's been pretty consistent. Um, you know, I think, it's funny because I don't recall where it really where it was a couple of years ago. Um, I know like the male female divide is always like super close to even, but slightly more female, um, almost like weirdly close to even though. Um, I mean, we're an unusual demographic for a magazine because like and a publication. And it's I think one of our challenges with advertisers is like we don't fit into like neat buckets that they have. Um, but yeah, I mean we're pretty similar age. Like we're around I think you know, 30 is kind of like our average age, give or take a year. Um, and definitely, you know, like as, by like the sort of metrics of influentialness, you know, if people like participate in like blogging or civic endeavors or all those kinds of things, like it's a, it's a very influential audience, which is cool. It's a very educated audience. Um, so yeah, and I think that's held pretty steady uh, as we've measured it. I mean, I guess the one big thing I'd say has shifted is like, online didn't meaningfully exist for us a couple of years back, and now it's really like the bulk of our effort. So like that doesn't have a benchmark like two years ago. Um, sorry if this sounds like a job interview question, but um, could you describe a fail and what you learned from it? A fail and what we learned from it? Um, well, I don't know that there's been like, like outright like total crash and burn failures. There's certainly been like bumps in the road. Um, I mean, there was like a terrible one with one of these IBM booklets where we sent it to print with a typo in it um, and had to like pay for that. Um, so like that was a disaster, but it, you know, I guess we learned to like copy edit better. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, honestly, what we probably did learn through that is like we were over taxing certain people, and like it, the you know checks and balances weren't strong enough there. So I do think you learn little things like that. Like our processes need to be stronger. Like we need to be like, if we're going to be doing all this stuff, we need to be investing in more people here. Um, you know, there's been we're about 45 people now, and definitely grow. Like it's kind of big. Um, <laughs> You know, and I don't think, it's interesting, like most of the people in the company in a leadership position haven't worked at any place like bigger than that. So I think there's, there's definitely a lot to like figure out in like growing an organization. And we've definitely made, you know, mistakes in who's where and what they're accountable for and stuff like that. Um, I mean, there are plenty of errors in things we have published in the past that, you know, I wish we could take many of those back. Not, nothing terribly egregious, but you know, just just things that didn't need to be there. Uh, question about one of your earlier infographics on high fructose corn syrup, and did that make things? You know, I really admire the Pepsi Refresh project, but do you get into editorial independence issues when you're hitting some of these hard issues and then working with corporate partners? Yes. Okay. Yes, we do. Um, yeah, and I, we, have not, we have not figured out how we, how we deal with those perfectly. But we definitely, there have been frustrated parties within our organization having to deal with the other people, you know, wanting to do their job. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the line we're trying to walk these days. Um, you know, and I think some of it's just, 
yeah, I mean, stuff we're figuring out. I think getting more confident in where we can put up internal lines, you know, is something that we're probably in the process of doing but haven't really done before. Wondering about live events. I know you're producing some events in LA. I'm wondering what, you know, how that fits into your vision as an organization. Why, why, what, what's the, what's the thinking behind that? So events were actually something we were like a huge part of good for the first two years. Um, pretty much as soon as we had our first website up, we started throwing events. Um, and I think it sort of came really naturally to us, and in many ways, I think was some of the more exciting stuff we did, where you know we got this group of people together for the first time, and like seeing all these people in a room was really exciting because it felt like a different group of people than had been in a room together before, because you had like designers with people working for the city government, with people who were like you know working in a nonprofit, and there was just interesting things bumping up against each other, and. Um, Again, sort of in priorities and stuff like that, like 2008, 2009, we sort of kind of shuttered a bunch of our event stuff. We're now actually, one of our big initiatives we're working on now is called Good Local, um, where we're starting to do kind of local, I don't know if you call them chapters, but local setups of good. Um, and we're sort of doing LA as like our test run. And I think with that, it'll definitely bring a lot more events to it. I think one of the things that we sort of ran into as good grew is like kind of wanting to do more events, but feeling like not feeling like it was unfair to people in different cities, but like just that we weren't we we weren't really properly reaching people like when you're trying to grow a nationwide audience by just like having an event in Chicago or something. But as we now sort of have this paradigm we're setting up for good local, I think that should bring a lot more events and some of our own events that we're gonna produce, but also just a lot of like good partnering with local events as a way to like promote and like connect this community to cool stuff that's going on with or without us. Um, how do you uh, approach getting, uh, like uh, when doing local things, how, how do you guys uh, approach uh, getting involved with, uh, you know, the, the local community? Like what, what do you do to, to get their attention? Yeah. Like what organizations do you, do you try and reach out to? Um, how, how do you get the word out for, for yeah. what you're doing and, uh, and getting involved locally? Yeah, I mean, we haven't done it quite enough. It's outside of our like really strong comfort zone, you know, like LA and New York. In the past, we've done a bunch of events and we've always had a lot of people there. Um, you know, I think, I think we're gonna sort of need to figure that out. Um, I mean, with LA, it's been a really interesting process of getting this, this good LA thing going. And one of the first things that we've done is like really identified, you know, we sort of built a little advisory board of like people we knew um, who sort of represented different areas of the city and kind of non profity but like in a cool innovative space. So like people working in education, people working for the city, people, you know, working in the design sphere, you know, whatever, these sort of different things. Um, and then sort of brought them together and sort of use that as like a sounding board for some organizations to get involved with and kind of places to have events, kind of key issues to get behind. You know, one of the things that we're sort of excited about with this local is, is kind of championing certain like local issues. Like, um, you know, LA had as a group called Sick Livia, which is modeled after something called Sick Lovia in um, Bogota, which like closed down a bunch of the streets in Bogota to like pedestrians and bikes. And so they're bringing this to LA and they did one last year where, so they closed down like seven or eight miles of LA's streets, which is like a pretty big deal in LA um, for a full afternoon. And they're doing it again. And um, so we sort of helped them do a fundraiser and we're having an event with them on the weekend of uh, their next event, which is I think in a weekend or two. Um, so like that's been a kind of cool thing to like rally the good community be like, this is good, we want this to happen, like let's support it. Um, so I think using those kind of things to help bring people together is probably one of the ways that we'll do it. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your own background. Did you always want to work in a magazine? And if you would please oblige us, did Danny DeVito have any idea what was going on? Or so, did, yeah. how did you explain to him sure. what he was doing? Danny, De Danny and DeVito, why? and I say this like, He's kind of as nuts as he seems like he is. Um, 
there's a video that we did. So he, I mean, he was amazing. I was there on that, that shoot day. Um, it was like right outside of our office in New York. Um, so we were doing, like, we wanted like a behind the scenes video with him. I mean, he would like grab the camera and was just like hamming it up like I've never seen anyone do in my entire life. At the end of the day, he actually orchestrated a shoot where he abducted the camera and like drove <laughs> off in his car. Um, and it was like totally brilliant and amazing. Um, so I think he totally knew, he was just game for it. I mean, the, the honest truth is like we knew Ben, the, our CEO, knew from school his daughter. So we sort of had like an in that way. Um, so he obliged us. Um, yeah, I mean, as for myself, um, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, so I always was definitely interested in like design, I would say. Um, I studied, I went to a liberal arts school and studied architectural studies and urban studies um, and was thinking I might go to architecture school. I did this like summer program that the Harvard Graduate School has called Career Discovery, which is like six weeks intensive like grad school. And I decided I didn't want to go to architecture school after that. Um, and, you know, then got into like some film stuff. But basically my senior year in college, I ended up trying to start a magazine with a friend of mine, um, which got like kind of far. It ended up, I went to Brown, RISD's right down the hill. So I like ended up meeting, you know, all these RISD kids and getting them involved. So we had like, sort of got some weird, very practical <laughs> experience um, building a business plan and all of these different facets of like directing designers. Um, and that was like a pretty exciting thing and we took it, we were like trying to raise money, trying to find partners to help us launch it and ended up not really working and we sort of went our separate ways. Um, so I think, but I definitely loved the medium of magazines like a ton, it was always a passion of mine. I always used to like go to record stores, but go to like the magazine rack to look at the records or to look at the, the magazines. Um, so I think, and when Ben, you know, one of my really good friends and now the CEO, you know, his dad had come out of the magazine publishing space of starting Inc. Um, and starting Sale Magazine before that. Um, and so I think it sort of felt natural to us. Like, and he knew that I had wanted to do this. So this idea came up and it was just like, all right, let's do a magazine. And we definitely had tons of people you know, 2005, saying, why are you starting a magazine? Um, and we were really sure it was a good idea. And I think it has been a good idea for us. I wouldn't advise it of everyone. Like, it costs a lot of money. Um, but it's fascinating that it does, it does make things seem really real. And, like, people take you much more seriously when you have, like, a real thing than if you're, like, we have a blog. Um, they'll take you seriously if you have a blog, but you have to have, like, a really successful blog. If you have, like, a crappy magazine that no one's heard of, people still sort of take you seriously. <laughs> um, so, yeah. There's one in the middle. Um, oh. My question goes back to um, kind of the work you're starting to do for corporations. Um, does it seem like there's a growing sort of interest from more of the corporation side in using, uh, you know, a service like yours, which kind of operates more towards that critical discourse in their marketing plans? Is that like a growing trend um, that you see sort of coming forth? Because it seems like there's a lot of interest by a younger demographic to have corporations engage in kind of civic service or, you know, other sort of nonprofit. Yeah, entities. I mean, I think what we've, we, we've noticed is a few things. I mean, one... I think there are a lot of corporations who are, seem very sincere about, like, they know they want to do good and to be active in this space and, you know, to, be, like, just be better corporate citizens and in all these respects. And they often have no idea how to do that or what that means. So they find, they seem to, like, be interested in talking to us as, like, a potential, like, someone who can help them figure that out. Um, you know, a lot of where we're currently operating is in the marketing space, like talking to their like, you know, ad agencies, marketing groups. Um, and I think that's like a really exciting, relevant place to start and like having meaningful conversations matters. I mean, producing media and content that's meaningful, I think matters. Um, but I also think it's not the only thing. So I, you know, I think at the end, these companies also definitely need to figure out how to like internal operations, actual product lines, you know, production processes need to align with the kinds of messages that they want to, to speak. Um, 
but I do think it's a really meaningful starting place, and, and I definitely, a lot of companies are interested in that. Um, I also think one of the things that's happening is like the agency model is kind of falling apart, like the big agency model. And so you're finding a lot of companies working with a ton of smaller shops rather than like a one you know, agency of record who owns everything. Um, so I think that's providing some interesting room for us like, to be, have a meaningful conversation with some of these companies um, that might have been much more difficult a few years ago. Common practice has O's and G's breaking out of the X height a little bit. Why is your D so damn tall? <laughs> right up here? This D in particular or generally our D? Generally, on your Okay. Um, you know, it's a, that's a good question. I can't, I can't answer that one. Um, you're the first person who's asked me that, though. Uh, did you have a question in the front? You could yell and I'll repeat it. You all have to wait. <laughs> so this question is about the website in particular and um, the balance between content that you generate and content that you kind of refer and mm -hmm. your role as a convener. And I'm wondering yep. how you balance those two and where you see your role is. And could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, one, I'm excited to say we actually just hired a new executive editor um, who literally started yesterday. Today's Tuesday. She started yesterday. Um, so I do think there are some changes afoot. Um, that I'm really excited about. And I think some of that is actually a bunch of growth and investment in our editorial operation that we haven't done in a while. Um, you know, we actually just recently hired two new editors towards the end of last year. Um, and, one, and I think with that, we're, I think you're going to see a shift towards more, the balance of more original stuff kind of go up and the sort of curatorial referring role. I think stay where it is and not necessarily decrease, but I think bolster that with more original things. Um, and I also think we're working on some pieces that, you know, like we've sort of been building out a tech team like, and sort of creating more tools and things like that. And I think we want to also figure out how to sort of open some of this up and let the community get more involved in some of the, the referring kind of curatorial side of things. Um, because if you think, I mean, I guess my thought on it is I think what we can really add value on is like, a lot of like context and sort of insights and like doing reporting and things like that. And I think there's just sort of uncovering and finding of like cool stuff. Um, I think we couldn't possibly find all of it ourselves. So like figuring out how to like get, you know, other people who know about these things to sort of, you know, self-interestedly promote those things or to just hear about them from friends and, and post them to the site. You know, we're sort of playing with some ways that that can happen. Um, because I think kind of getting more people involved in the sort of collaborative nature that I've spoken to is definitely an interest. And I think it can really happen in like identifying like the easy stuff, like that's good, like this event is good, like that new innovation is really cool. Um, but the more like original, you know, reported things, um, sort of thought provocative, thought provoking kinds of things, um, I think is where a lot of our editorial weight is gonna shift. Um, we're also I'm super excited. We're hiring a data editor right now, um, which will be a brand new position for us. So someone who kind of comes from like a visual journalism kind of background. Part it's like it's like this interesting hybrid role that you're starting to see a, a bit more of. But part designer, part like statistician, like someone who knows like Python and R and like interesting things, so they can like actually make sense of big data. Um, so like that's a role I'm super excited about and I think can really help us take our work in infographics and data visualization to the next level, which I think we really need to do. All right. Did, did we do it? <laughs>